if a magic book is going to come out for D&D again, I want it to be on the caliber of Ravnica, not Strixhaven. Hello and welcome to Every Edition, your tabletop RPG talk show. I'm Jesse. I'm John. And today's Loot the Body segment, we're going to be talking about Mutant High School. You bet we are. And our random encounter today, the latest 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons book, Strixhaven. I've got things to talk about with Strixhaven. And of course, we always (laughs) talk about our uh, morale check and uh, news of the week and news of what's going on in the RPG world. So, John, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. Uh... A couple, uh, couple new things have come into the Every Edition uh, collection, Every Edition Studios here, if yeah. you will. The Nerd Cave, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> nice sweatshirt, looking good. Um, but actually, uh, for the holidays, I received a number of, of role-playing books from, from friends and family. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, most of them actually were from the Modifius 2D20 uh, series. So a uh, couple Conan books. Mm-hmm. And a couple Star Trek books. So uh, I'm going to be looking at those this month and kind of getting myself familiar with that system. I've never played the 2D20 game system. I think the 2D20 system, uh, we talked about it uh, sort of loosely in our free RPG day Mm -hmm. episode. Uh, I think that's a really interesting system. I'm not like a Trekkie. I'm not a Conan guy. So I don't know too much about those. But I imagine uh, they also used it for Dune as well. Yes. Yep. I, and I, and Octoon Cthulhu. Octoon, yeah. <laughs> I think I think it's a really cool idea and uh, I'd be interested to play Star Trek or Conan, I think. Yeah, I think I mean I am a I am a Conan guy and a and a Star Trek guy. So mm-hmm. um but I do think you would want to have people who also, you know, ideally if you're going to play a Star Trek game it's people who are Trekkies. Um and that might be hard to hard to come <laughs> by or a very specific yeah, yeah, group niche. of folk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um but but at any rate both of them are at least really fun to read, so I'm having I'm having a good time reading, reading those, and hopefully getting a chance to play them in the new year. Sure, Jesse, how you doing? I also celebrate Christmas, and <laughs> this year uh, my D and D groups uh, were gracious enough to get me some things for Christmas. Cool. So I have those here because they're great. Um, so I have um, I can't remember what we named it, but I have a, a little mimic, sort of squishy, almost like oh. vinyl pop type of deal. Squishy mimic. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And uh, I have my prize possession now, which is actually good for uh, using as a mini uh, this gigantic Funko of uh, Tiamat. <laughs> yeah, it is appropriate size for a it's uh, yeah for a mini. Well, so Wizards of the Coast uh, just released <laughs> like a a mini. It's a maxi or like yeah, a yeah, gigantic yeah. gargantuan yes. Tiamat that was like four hundred dollars or something, and that's. I'm all for buying big dragons, but four hundred dollars cool. is a little yeah. out of my price range. Me, to me too. <laughs> so having this as a mini really is awesome because you know if uh, one of my groups is playing through the Horde of the Dragon Queen, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, spoiler alert for a book that's been out for seven years now, um, <laughs> you do fight an avatar of Tiamat at the end of the second book, and uh, uh, at the time, I, I used like some generic five-headed dragon mini, uh-huh. but this is like you know perfect size compared to like regular minis for an avatar of Tiamat, and it looks cool. And it comes with a really cool dice. It's like a, I mean, it's like a snot-colored dice, but uh, it's yeah, pretty cool. It's cool. I like it. All right, it's time for a morale check. Morale checks are when we go over the uh, tabletop gaming industry and news of the news of the time, news of the moment. Lots of news. Lots of news. So uh, in the new year, 2022. Um, pre-orders are up for the Essence 20 role-playing game line, which is the lineup of G.I. Joe Transformers and Power Rangers. Yes. And so um, you can right now pre-order uh, the books, obviously. Mm. You can also pre-order dice. You can pre-order dice bags. You can pre-order uh, GM screens. Yep. Uh, exclusive, uh, exclusively on uh, on the website. Uh, are um, alternate covers, which I know you're a fan of. <laughs> so, um, are, are, are you aware? Do you can you buy the alternate covers in, individually, or do you have to get them in a set? So the set is for the Power Power Rangers set only. Okay. Uh, there, there's an alt cover for GI Joe. There's an alt cover for Transformers, and then there's a a deluxe set of I think six books mm. 
for Power Rangers, and each book is is a single color representing each of the core Rangers plus the Green Ranger, sure. right from from the Mighty Morphin era, um, and and that set is three hundred dollars. I guess you know for six books, <laughs> you know if you're going to plunk down fifty, and you same. had, but if you had six people, I guess you could split it. I don't know. Well, so um, <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about that, like yeah. you know, if if you've got six people, you know, five people including the GM, you could each get. A different color book. Right. You could each be a different ranger. You could get the different color dice bags and dice to represent your ranger. You yeah. could like really lean into the the Power Ranger if you're if you're into that. There's a gaming group out there that'll buy it and split it up. Yeah. And there and I'm sure there's rabid collectors out there that will buy it and never open it. So it's you know <laughs> there, there's something the for everybody. The book that I want is the Green Ranger one. R- and well, well I. Nope, too many, too many RPGs. Well, and I'd want the Pink Ranger, so here's two. Uh, now we've got we four, give us an email if you want more. <laughs> four more Rangers, um, but yeah, I I don't know my my uh, my spider sense is tingling with this, and not in a good way. Um, and I think it has to do actually with the uh, the free role playing mm. game adventure that's out. It's the only thing that's out right now for for Essence Twenty. Um, it's really bland. It, it really it, it doesn't was very light. Yeah. Very bland. It doesn't have any flavor of Transformers, G.I. Joe, Power Rangers. It is, I think they, they tried to come up with an adventure that you could run in either of the three games. Mm. And in trying to thread that needle, they missed. I mean, that's <laughs> my, and so my my first impression of the game is there's a lot of things that I could put money on, mm-hmm. right, that I could spend money on. But not a lot of stuff that I've seen that's actually made me have any confidence in wanting to actually spend my money sure. on the game. So I, uh, I'm not going to be an early adopter. <laughs> as as excited as I am about a GI Joe role playing game, sure. which could be awesome, um, I, I'm I'm not going to be an early adopter. I'm going to wait. Uh, it's there's too too many red flags for me sure. are, are starting to go off that this is a cash grab and and the game could be total crap. I have no I, I have no idea. It might look really good. It, but... Right. Right. So I'm a little I'm a little skeptical um uh going in I want to I want to hear some initial reports from mm-hmm. people that get preview or promo copies or something like that and 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 get some initial reviews in before I spend my Take hard-earned points, dollars. Yeah. So at the beginning of the month, uh beginning of the year uh, Roll20 announced uh, that they, they started a pre-order for Cyberpunk Red on Roll20. Uh, I couldn't really find a date for it, but mm-hmm. I had thought that somewhere I had seen you know early February, late January, that it'll be officially released. Uh, I pre-ordered it day one because I've been wanting to play Cyberpunk uh, uh, on the table oh, yeah. uh, for forever. Um, ever since yeah, I got, there was a Humble Bundle a couple months ago that had all the PDFs of all the original cyberpunk RPG stuff. Oh, cool. And I'd taken a look through there and it seemed really cool. And uh, we got the starter sets and the, the core rule books. And yes. that was a really cool read. Um, but uh, Roll20 is going to enable me to like actually play with people because obviously playing online has a, a, a further reach than sure. everything that's going on you know, sure. around us. And you uh, you announced before that this was happening, so it's good to see it's, it's moving forward. And mm-hmm. I'm like you, I can't wait to get it on the table yes. and even if it's a virtual tabletop <laughs> just get the game get it going yeah, um, we, we'd asked uh, people before and, and please uh, you know reach out to us and let us know what you think about uh, the cyberpunk red hmm. um, had a couple discussions with people about it on uh, different Facebook groups and nice. things nice, nice. Um, and uh, some mixed uh, some mixed reviews so I'm, I'm looking forward to trying it myself hmm. all right so in other news uh, there is no zine quest for happening in February. Hmm. So February has been the month where for the past, uh, well, the past three or three four years. years, yeah, three years, uh, Kickstarter has promoted Zine Quest, which has been a time for um, people to release their tabletop role-playing uh, zines, and there's, it gets a nice little banner and a little bit of attention from Kickstarter, mm. and it drives people to um, to lots of independent projects and smaller, smaller gaming projects. Um, and it's at a time normally where Kickstarter is not getting a lot of hits and a lot of attention anyway. Sure. So it was a it was sort of a it seemed like a good a good symbiotic sure. relationship. Um, well, that's not happening. Not happening this year. Uh, they announced that they're going to be moving it to August. Okay. They didn't say why, um, but unfortunately for a lot of creators, um, you know, they were banking on the fact yeah. that it was going to be happening in a couple weeks. And uh, they kind of feel like they've gotten the rug pulled out from under them. So there is a, a new movement online called Zemo or Zine Month, 
Uh, and it's uh, basically uh, th- those creators that still want to do something in February or were planning uh, or, or, you know, banking on the fact that there was going to be a, a kick, uh, you know, a Kickstarter zine quest. They're still going to go forward with it. Nice. Um, so check out zinemonth.com. And the movement is called Zemo. Uh, looks like it's got some potential for at least sort of organizing things. Yeah. Um, outside of Kickstarter. Yep. And, and, you know, outside of, yeah, Kickstarter's banner. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess they'll, Kickstarter will still try to do something in August, but it's definitely um, ruffled some feathers, to yeah. say the least. That seems like uh, not a nice thing for them to do. Yeah. <laughs> and, un- un- and unexpected. And it, w- it was... Um, ZineQuest last year, ZineQuest 3 was a highlight for me of, uh, of 2021, mm. just in, t- in terms of uh, my own sort of re- uh, c- collecting and reading and um, uh, role-playing experience of 2021. I really enjoyed participating in ZineQuest 3. That's where a lot of the ninth level games, mm-hmm. uh, the great new ninth level game stuff came out of that, um, like Savage Sisters, uh, Rebel Scum. Uh, sure. That that kind of stuff. Good independent um, stuff. Yeah, good I- good indie stuff and independent creators. Mm. So in just a couple weeks, Monsters of the Multiverse will be here. Let's go. In the form of a hundred and seventy dollar <laughs> bundle <laughs> kit from Wizards of the Coast uh, that you can only get when you purchase it from or purchase it with the other two books, the yep. uh, Xanathar's Guide and Tasha's Cauldron. Mm-hmm. Uh, two books of which I already own. Uh, two books which you may already own if you buy every new and out, uh, upcoming uh, D&D book. Yep. Um, there's a, a little solace in that uh, there are alternate covers mm-hmm. that are different than the original alternate covers. Uh, I took a look at eBay, and eBay, uh, they were selling um, alternate covers of Xanathar's Guide for like $300. No. So that was one of the first alternate cover right. fifth edition books. Yep. Um, so and then that was really before this sort of like new age boom of fifth edition happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so most people don't have that. So it, it'll be good for some collectors to get an alternate cover of a book that that's been out for a little while, you know. But Tasha's just came out, mm-hmm. and this new book, you know, it all of the new alternate covers they all match, so it looks nice, and it comes with a DM screen and a slip case for all of them. So mm-hmm. you know, it's going to look really good, and it, it's going to be a, a solid buy. A solid purchase, but as a, as I'd say, as a new and up and coming D and D player, it would be a really solid purchase. Mm-hmm. As a as someone who is invested in in fifth edition from day one or something, uh, this may not be the best way to go about this. Uh, I have heard tales that um, stores may be getting the bundles and then breaking them up, oh. opening them up and selling the books individually. Uh, I think that could be a really good idea, um, especially for people who only want the new book uh, because then they still have the stock of the other stuff too. That wouldn't be uh, on the up and up though, would it? Would that be like yeah, you copacetic? Could, yeah, you, I think you could do whatever you want as long okay. as you, you know, All right. you, if you purchase it from Wizards or for whatever distributor, you're, yeah. you're allowed to do whatever you're allowed you want. To, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I don't know the logistics of that, but uh, I, I have heard tale that some stores may be doing that. Okay. Um, so, so look at your uh, local hobby shop for that uh, in case you just want the, uh, the new book. Uh, I myself am going to be getting the the trio of the alternate covers uh, <laughs> because I can't help myself and I'm addicted to alternate covers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the alternate covers are white, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're they're f- a, a far difference from the um, the original trio book of the Player's Handbook, Monsters Manual, and mm-hmm. uh, the DM's Guide, mm-hmm. which were like that sort of black yeah. alternate cover. Um, and you know, as a if if I was working in a store and someone came up to me and they already had those the original trio of books. This is the second trio of stuff I would give them, like player books, like Xanathar's Guide mm-hmm. and Tasha's, uh, and almost like sort of an expanded uh, monster manual with this new uh, Monsters of the Multiverse, mm-hmm. as well as you know it probably has um, rules for uh, um, you know other other sort of games like uh, Spelljammer and, mm-hmm. and you know I, I guess. I don't know if they'll have Eberron stuff, mm-hmm. but uh, they are going to have all the, uh, the the supplementary races and everything from, right. from all the books that have come out in one book. Uh, so it is going to be essential for some people. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, if you can find the book on its own, maybe even online, uh, I would probably recommend that unless you want the alternate covers. Yeah, and I think it'll be... Um, 
if you if you wait, it is going to get released by itself, but just not for not for not for a, a while, not for a while. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, it, is, it feels a little bit like a cash grab, <laughs> I, you know. But you know, you you can wait. Um, and I guess on D and D Beyond, you'll be able to buy it uh, individually, or at least buy parts okay. of it individually. All right. So All right. if, if if that's your your jam, you can buy it on D and D Beyond too. Okay, and it does come with a with a new DM screen. Yeah. I'm all about um, DM screens. Yep. I love using screens. I know uh, some <laughs> DMs really don't. And some people, like, really, they'll die on the hill of, you know, you should never hide your, your dice rolls, that right. kind of thing. But DM screens have useful information that I use all the time. So, sure. Yeah. Let us know what you think about the Monsters of Mo- uh, Multiverse thing. Are you going to spend $170 for two books that you already own and a new book? <laughs> Are you going to wait? Are you going to find an alternate method of uh, D&D Beyond or some store that may break them up uh, let us know at every edition rpg at gmail.com or in the comment section down below if you're watching on youtube yeah and don't forget to check out every edition rpg.com to find links to all of our socials including facebook twitter and instagram you also can check out our patreon where there's a journal of some of our process behind the scenes mm. and um, i'm continuing the quest on twitter to try to work my way through every magic item in the encyclopedia and your magica past- Amulets. I am done with amulets, everybody. There you go. So I'm I'm still in the A's uh, as of this recording, but I'm continuing to to make progress. And um, so so check out everyeditionrpg.com for uh, your daily dose of every edition. It's time for a random encounter. Today's random encounter. We are reviewing Strixhaven. Oh yeah. The latest D and D book uh, came out the tail end of last year, and uh, I've I, it's kind of a mixed bag. There's a lot of good things about it. There's some questionable things about it. Um, all in all, I, I'm i glad that I purchased it because it's got some cool stuff in it. Cool stuff as a DM. Mm-hmm. Um, cool stuff as a player, too. Um, the first thing, I just want to talk about the uh, the Owlin, uh, which is the first native flight uh, character race that you can play as. Uh, so it is an owl person that has flight speed natively uh equal to its walking speed. Okay. Which is kind of nuts. So, like, the gem dragonborn from Fizzbins had a use this once per day, and you only got it as a fifth-level dragonborn um, to get gem wings that would, for a certain amount of time, give you flight equal to your walking speed. Um, Other than that, there's been a few, like, once per short rest, once per long rest, flight mm-hmm. stuff or gliding or anything like that. But Allen just get it natively, and they also have advantage on stealth, which mm. is um, you could you could do some things with that. Yeah, <laughs> especially if you're fighting in the air stealthily as a rogue, and you've got sneak attack and some other crazy like sci knife stuff from Tasha's. It's you could get you could get really bonkers and. Uh, um, personally, as a DM, if someone came to me as uh, as a player and wanted to play an Allen, I'd have no problem with it. Okay. But I definitely keep an eye on the encounters. I definitely adjust them, um, maybe even on the fly, if things started to go a little bit too far. Yeah, I wonder if they're because, you know, one of the things about uh, the Strixhaven book is it's not, it doesn't really f- have a, like a home base. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and so releasing the Owlin with a setting that doesn't have a firm location is interesting to me because the Owlin then don't really have a home. Yeah, per where, se, where do right? they come from? Do right. they come from Strix? So Strixhaven, if, if you're unaware, um, was a Magic the Gathering set. And the way worlds work in Magic the Gathering is very similar to D&D, where there's these sort of like spheres mm-hmm. that uh, only certain people can tra- uh, traverse. Or if you have things similar to spell jammers, you can traverse them as well, but they're like high tech and nobody has them. Okay. Really. So the idea of Strixhaven is like people from all over come to Strixhaven as a college and study magic, but where do the Allen come from? Mm-hmm. You know, do they do they have a home and we just don't know it yet? Do they come from everywhere? Can you play or does an Allen exist in Faerun? Mm-hmm. You know. I think they've just left it open to interpretation um, just so you can fit it in any setting that you want or any setting that a character or a player would want to play as. Right. Um, and with the Owlin not tied, you know, to a specific world, it, you know, then if that idea of native flight 
doesn't work at your table, <laughs> yeah. right? Then it's not the end of the. You're not like destroying a whole, you know, race of of creatures and characters for sure. an already established world. You're just saying, no, there's no Alan. <laughs> Boop, yeah, they're gone, yeah, yeah, right? And fair, it's not, fair. you know, it's not a it's not a big loss because um, it hasn't been firmly established, like mm-hmm. where Strixhaven is or where the Alan, uh, you know, come from. Yeah, and I've not heard any word of any further Strixhaven things. Mm-hmm. So I don't even know if Wizards is, is planning on doing uh, expansions on any of this stuff. Yeah. Um, hopefully. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, so my my initial take on this is kind of like the old Western, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> okay. So we'll start with the good, okay. which um, I, do th- I do think the Owlin are interesting. And, and my favorite thing about the book is uh, the fact that the location is kind of nebulous. But it's teased that Strixhaven uh, might be located uh, uh, in the city of Sigil. Yep. Which, um, for those of you that are aren't familiar with uh, Sigil in Dungeons and Dragons, it is the uh, the main hub for Planescapes, mm-hmm. and it's located in the Outlands, which is sort of a neutral border uh, uh, for all the outer planes. Uh, it's called the the Great Wheel, and there's this axis axis in the middle that all the all the outer planes uh, sort of spin around, mm-hmm. and Sigil is right in the center, and it's a great city uh, that connects all you know has portals to all the different uh, all the different planes of mm-hmm. existence, and it is a city, so you could plunk uh, Strixhaven just in the city of Sigil. Um, and, uh, and there you go. Boof. There's its location. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense that you would have people coming from all over because it is at the center of, of the multiverse mm-hmm. uh, for Dungeons and Dragons. So cool suggestion fits in, you know, fits in nicely. Um, and, and I think they didn't uh, say it firmly um, yeah. because it because it does come from magic. And because there was like mentioning of a magic world, mm-hmm. I, I don't even like who cares what, um, <laughs> right? You know, mentioning that it was from some magic world, um, but then they did plant it, like plant the seed, like oh, if you're going to do it in D and D, here's where it could be, and that worked for me, and especially worked for me because it br- it's bringing Sigil back, and again, it's starting to hint at what's coming next, which is probably five point five. Yep, and and Spelljammer and Planescapes and mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I get I get excited about that. I liked seeing that, and I went back to the manual of the planes, the the um, the third edition manual of the planes, mm. um, to look up the Outlands and the location of Sigil and sort of think about it. And it's a the Outlands are a neutral, uh, neutral kind of plane, um, and uh, so that that again also sort of made sense to me if you're having. Uh, connecting all the different all the different worlds. If you have a college, you know that being yep. on a neutral plane where people can come and learn stuff and then leave. Yep, seems yeah, it seems fitting. Yeah, so so that was a good. That was the good. What about the bad? Uh, the bad. So the the first thing that struck me as bad about this was almost right away, and it was when it mentioned that and and, and reinforced right as part of your orientation that Strixhaven is a university. <laughs> And I, like you, uh, noble listeners, was thinking this is going to be D&D Harry Potter, yep. right? <laughs> um, and so when I read the book and they said, it, well, actually, it's college, I was like, no. <laughs> like, college and high school are not the same. They're way different. They're way different. And so if you're talking about uh, a university in a big city, that's not going to have that same, uh, you know, self-contained community, Mm -hmm. everybody living together feel that Hogwarts has, right? Hogwarts is remote. Yeah. And and right, and people come from all over to this remote location. And then they they, stay there. They stay there and that's their community. You know, if you go to NYU or Columbia and you're in New York City, right? Like you don't have to hang out with other college students. Yeah, you could be a loner. You know, you yeah, and you don't have to interact with your professors outside of going to the lecture. Like it's not um so that took me out of it right away because I was thinking, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Mm. It can't be a university and be this sort of intimate uh, community experience. It just uh, to me it didn't it didn't gel. And and then also have it be in a city. Like all those elements didn't feel like didn't they mesh. fit. Yeah. Um, you know, and and some of that was pl- was playing with my expectations of it being Harry Potter D and D. Well. 
first paragraph they emphasize this is college. I was like, <laughs> ah. Well, so, so. When, it, when it came out for Magic, uh, one of the biggest selling points was, hey, this is like Magic, but also Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. And I remember there were people getting into it because they liked Harry Potter sure. and they liked Magic and they liked that sort of house structure. Mm -hmm. So when it came to D and D, I was kind of excited. Um, but yeah, and being a university just doesn't fit. It doesn't have that same sort of like, like blissful hope mm -hmm. and like cheeriness that like Harry Potter like young audience stuff has. Um, it seems a bit I don't know. It just doesn't. It just doesn't mesh. It doesn't jive. Yeah. Well, and Harry Potter is steeped in the tradition of. Uh, you know, the uh, the English boarding school yeah. story. Right. Um, and so that idea of like being sent off to school and then living with your friends and that sort of thing. And, you know, college has some of that, except in those boarding school stories, the teachers that you live with become sort of your parental figures. Yeah. That doesn't happen in college. <laughs> I never thought I never thought of any professors as like parental figures. Sure, sure. They were. They were my professors. They were the professor. <laughs> but they weren't like, you know, mom and dad away from home. Sure. Um, whereas, you know, I, if you've had a boarding school experience or, if, you know, like in Hogwarts at in Harry Potter, like it's very clear that there is like a, you know, that kind of parental uh, in loco parentis sort of mm -hmm. relationship uh, going on. So it's yeah, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't have the same feel and they want to and they want it you to have that sort of like respect for faculty mm. and like you know so it still kind of does some of the harry potter things with like the relationships between students and faculty that i just don't buy in the college university setting so again it just it didn't it didn't work <laughs> so um, uh, other than the allen they also introduce the backgrounds for all of the different houses yeah in uh, in strixhaven and this has caused a bit of a pain point in the online community for D&D. &D. Um, whether or not that these backgrounds can or should be used in your D&D &D game. Because mm. the backgrounds themselves are pretty nuts. They're, you know, a background for your for your player. Um, you can choose to come from Lorehold, mm -hmm. which is a sort of, um, you know, a, a very... Uh, astute sort of not religious but studying like religious text and things like history that. and archaeology yeah, archaeology yeah, yeah. yep um and you could you could pick that as maybe a fighter and if you pick that background you gain spells you gain like a paladin spell or a cleric spell oh or whatnot so you gain access to spell casting where you maybe wouldn't be otherwise unless you take a particular path um but you get access to spells or extra spells mm -hmm. based on your background that may be potent or powerful. Um, there's a few spells in the book that, uh, um, specifically from the, the Silver Quill um, house. That, that was my favorite of the houses. They're yeah. sweet. They're sweet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there's a spell that is um, uh, another pain point for the community. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, you know, if, if I was running a game, and somebody asked me if they wanted to use a Strixhaven background, I would, of course, say yes, but you need to adequately explain it. Mm -hmm. You know, how are you a level one character who has gone through Strixhaven and <laughs> attained the background, mm -hmm. stayed a level one character, and made it to wherever we're having our campaign? Mm -hmm. How did that happen? And it seems like such a weird hurdle that you have to go through i mean you don't need to go through that you could just say yes or no right. but for right. me personally i would like there to be a reason and you know that just adds a little bit more to the background a little bit more to the to the role playing and it just it's just, like i said it's just a pain point mm -hmm. um you could just gloss over it but i'm not that kind of person so. yeah <laughs> uh but i will say my good if i had to pick one good yeah what's your good um there is a magic item. It's an uncommon magic item uh, that was introduced. They had, I think, uh, maybe five to six magic items introduced for, for Strixhaven. Uh, and I love magic items. Oh, sure. Um, is the bottle of boundless coffee. <laughs> it's, a, it's a flask. It's like a never-ending flask. Mm -hmm. you know, as long as you drink from it, it will be uh, appropriately warm coffee, however you like it. Um, if you try to pour it out into something, it will just disappear you just have to drink it, you know, directly from the flask, but it's okay. never ending. And it's an uncommon item, so you could like you real realistically buy it. Um, 
<laughs> I thought that was really cool. That's cool. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, the, I guess, you know, the other um, the other thing that I thought was good, again, if we want to speak positively of it, I did like the founding dragons. Mm. Um, and the I, headmasters or the founding yeah, uh, of each of the houses. They were cool. Um, and I also liked the the mascots and how sure. how diverse they were in terms of creatures. Mm-hmm. Um, so that those two aspects of, of, of the houses felt really good to me. I like that they all had a founding dragon. I like that they all had a, a mascot and the mascots collectively were so different. Yeah, so diverse. Um, like the Silver Quill one was just like an ink monster. I love that guy. Just, the inkling. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's cool. Yeah, <laughs> he's cool. I, like, And that... I might take the inkling mm. and use and use that as like a a, a wizard's familiar sure. or something like that, uh, you know. But just totally out of context, like I don't. And know. they they do fit. Even the wither bloom has like a little uh, insect, little dude, mm-hmm. like a caterpillar type thing. That that type of stuff isn't necessarily strictly for Strixhaven. Is that the pest? Yes, the pest. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so I liked. I, I I thought that was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're getting into the if we're getting into the bad or even into the ugly <laughs> territory, I thought it was super lazy that they had um, apprentices, pledges, and and generic professors mm. for all all five of the houses, and they took up each of them took up their own like monster manual page. Yep. So like you know those those you know two professors, a pledge, and an apprentice. Time. So that's twenty pages of Plus like the uh, the headmaster or the yeah. uh, the founding dragons. Well, I like so I like that. That was cool. yeah. Th- those were those sweet. Were cool. <laughs> but this this felt it kind of, it felt kind of lazy. It was like okay, so we're gonna do, you know, they had like a checklist. So everybody needs to have a founding mm-hmm. dragon. Everybody needs to have a mascot. We're gonna have two professors, a pledge, and an apprentice. Oh, we're done. We do the monster section is finished. Yeah. Cut it. Press and it, it just felt uh, really redundant. Um, not inspired. Uh, very formulaic. Um, it felt like they were trying to see how fast they could crank out a D and D book mm. as close to the release of a new magic set as possible. <laughs> and I swear, I swear it feels like they're testing the waters, right? Like we're going to do a new magic set mm. and then how quickly can we use the same art and the concepts and get a, get a D and D book out. And if we can, and if we can, do it in a, sh- a short enough amount of time, and they're both successful. Well, then we can go ahead and it. replicate that yeah, yeah. again. All of that stems from the magic set. Yeah, you know, uh, clearly, like you know, they the legendary creatures. There's yeah. the professors. There's the dragons. There are the apprentices and all that. Yeah, and they're all the same art. Yeah, and they're very clearly inspired by their stat blocks. And it's like, you know, it makes sense that they would do that because they already have all those assets and all that stuff ready to go. Yeah, but they didn't. They didn't fluff it up. They didn't give anything extra, or they didn't. It doesn't seem like they put any extra effort to the D and D side. Yeah. Um, so, like, like you said, it, it seems very rushed. And honestly, there's there's a level uh, up to level ten adventure in this book, which blew my mind because I thought it was just going to be like a one shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, hey, this is what you do if you want to have an adventure in a school. You could do like year by year type of thing, which sounds, you know, Hogwartsy kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And, you know, up to the DM to sort of navigate that within the rules of D&D. But it's a it's a full adventure. This is an adventure that would take you, you know, if you meet once every two weeks or once a month, it's going to take you a whole year to finish it. Right. Yeah, that's a full campaign. And yep. I, I just couldn't ever see myself doing that, which made me question why I paid $50 for a book <laughs> where half of it I'm never going to use. Right. Which, you know, I would have been happy if they would split the book into the DM and player stuff Mm -hmm. for 30 bucks Mm -hmm. and the adventure and the monsters or something for 30 bucks. I probably would have bought both Mm -hmm. for an extra $10 on top of the $50. But having that option of, hey, I don't want the adventure this time, um, it would have been really, really nice. Yeah, it, it, uh, it felt like, to me, it felt like, they didn't have enough setting to have just a setting book. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, if you really dig into those four adventures, they also didn't have enough adventure <laughs> for, for just an, an adventure, adventure book. <laughs> so, like, it's like two halves of two incomplete books yeah. that make one crappy book. Like, and, I, I, yeah, this, I, folks, this is not, uh, I do not recommend this Strixhaven book. Like, it's, uh, it might be, 
I'm looking here. <laughs> I'm looking here at the shelf and all the all the fifth edition books. Like it, it could be one of the one of the it, worst. It's definitely among the bottom five. Yeah. Um, I'd say if you're gonna uh, purchase a Magic the Gathering book um, for D and D, go with the Ravnica. Ravnica book. Yep. That one had many, many more Magic the Gathering sets and novels written for Ravnica yeah. and comic books and yep. online D and D resources compiled together for one big source book that had a one shot in it that was mm-hmm. really good and had player options and dm stuff that ten, was 10 guilds 10 guilds yes, yes. the whole ravnica city explored yep, yep. and that was if, if if a magic book is going to come out for DD again i want it to be on the caliber of ravnica not strixhaven right it it feels rushed it feels like two incomplete books mm. uh smushed together and i do like i said before i really do wonder if they were trying to see how fast they could get a new a new and and you know the other thing too is like the magic set was great yeah it was fantastic i actually really liked strixhaven Mm -hmm. as you know we don't we don't talk a lot about magic on the show but we do sometimes and and i liked the strixhaven magic the gathering set a lot of flavor a lot of cool cards very cool cool dragons and and (laughs) and it and as a as a card you know as a as a magic expansion um it felt kind of ravnica e because the houses were sort of reminiscent of guild of the guilds right um and and i dug i dug that i thought the the, and so there was a lot of promise you know a lot of hope the magic set was decent the harry potter thing could be really cool (laughs) you know it didn't it didn't it didn't land they didn't stick the landing um yeah, and there, it, it, truth be told, too, there's there there are some cool uh, magic items, there are some cool spells, but there's not a lot of magic items. There's not a lot of spells. Uh, it's very it's very lean um, when it comes to that kind of stuff. So upcoming this oh. year, we've we've not heard any Magic: The Gathering D and D news. Mm-hmm. I don't believe. I could see them doing something for Kamigawa because that's that's a fan favorite mm-hmm. uh, world that they've explored. They explored about twenty years ago, mm-hmm. and our uh, next month. Um, and I could see them potentially doing something more for Baldur's Gate because there's a Magic the Gathering Baldur's Gate set coming out. Okay. Um, so we could get more D&D Magic crossover later this year in terms of like uh, source books. Mm-hmm. But uh, hopefully hopefully it's not quite the same uh, level that Strixhaven was. <laughs> yeah. That's one, one final thought about the Strixhaven book. Um, after, you know, after having read it, like go, going into the book, I was like, wow. Harry Potter role playing game could be cool, hmm. and I finished reading the Strixhaven book, and I had second thoughts about whether or not that was true. <laughs> right, like I was kind of like, "You want to take exams?" Oh. Ma- right. I was like, "Actually, maybe a Harry Potter role playing game wouldn't be as cool as I think it is." Like, <laughs> or you know, and and maybe the proof is in the pudding here. Like, I, if the, if this was the 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 best attempt, so, you know, so far at yeah. a Harry Potter role playing <laughs> game. It sucks. Like I don't want to. I don't want to do a bunch of skill checks to take exams, <laughs> or like you know a bunch of skill checks for studying or yeah, whatever. Studying like, come to on. increase that, your stats or something. Boy, talk about I lo- that. That's real great escape. You know, I'm really, <laughs> I'm really having a good time here. Let's <laughs> let's take exams and and boy, who doesn't want to go back to those awkward days of high school? Like I just had all these. You know, you get beat up by the bully. <laughs> yeah, I just had I I I. I I started to second guess my enthusiasm for a Harry Potter role playing game. I was like, you know what? Maybe this is one franchise that doesn't need, you know, yep. as much as you might think it would be good. Uh, and I guess like uh, a Fantastic Beasts game sure. would be better. Truth be told, right? If do a Harry Potter world mm-hmm. that's really more like a Fantastic Beasts uh, role playing game, but actually like trying to do Hogwarts and like playing. Quidditch as a role playing game, like that, all, <laughs> I didn't even think of that. <laughs> all that kind. Well, there is so there's like a Quidditch in in um, in Strixhaven, right? It's not it's not oh, it's yes. not Quidditch, but it's like a capture yeah, the flag. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, you capture the other team's mascot, mm-hmm. right? So that was a cool idea. I like that, but again, I don't want to the 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 role playing aspects like that feels like uh you know that, that feels like a video game or yeah. or even like, like a board, board game. game, but it doesn't necessarily I you know, like. And I've got your mascot now, Jesse. Oh, like it just ah. Let me roll a d twenty. <laughs> you know you don't. You, like, come <laughs> on, stop it. Like it's just. Um, so I totally take back. Uh, I, I don't know that. I don't know that we need um, uh, a Harry Potter role playing game. So I, I would say, <laughs> uh, if you haven't gotten Strixhaven so far, 
Um, Don't. And, and, <laughs> and nothing in it interests you. Save your money for the Monsters of the Multiverse bundle because uh, I have high hopes for that. Yeah, uh, and that should be that should be great. Well, and I bet the Owlin are going to be in. Yeah, in and the, the Owlin are going to be right. in that because so. they're all the uh, the races. So, it's, yeah. All right, so let us know what you think. Uh, did you have the same uh, impression of, of Strixhaven as we did, or or are you ready to uh, attend Strixhaven? U? are you ready to earn your bachelor's degree in magic? Um, let us know. Uh, send us a note at everyeditionrpg at gmail.com and check us out at everyeditionrpg.com. All of our socials are waiting for you. Interact with us. Send us an email, comment, like, subscribe, hit that button thingy. Do <laughs> All your... that stuff really, really helps. The way the YouTube algorithm works and uh, even like Spotify and all your, your yeah. favorite podcast stuff. It really helps get the show out there, and uh, we're just trying to spread the love of RPGs. You bet. All right, it's time to loot the body. Today's loot the body review is Mutant High School. Uh, this is a zine that's put out by our friends over at Goodman Games, mm. and it is for the Mutant Crawl Classics uh, role-playing game, which itself is... Is a uh, is a version of the Dungeon Crawl Classics mm. role playing game, which itself is a version of Third Edition Dungeons and Dragons, uh, which itself is a version of you know so on and so forth. Keep going. Keep on going. No, um, but so Mutant uh, Mutant High School is a, is a zine that that came out um, as part of Goodman Games' uh, uh, virtual convention that mm. they held back at the end of uh, 2021. And uh, it was available at that virtual convention for the first time. And it is an expansion of the uh, Mutant Crawl Classics game. Um, it is set in uh, California, mm. in, uh, I believe, Fresno, California. No-go city. No-go city, right. <laughs> Fresno, California, that has been uh, covered in toxic uh, ooze and waste <laughs> And totally uh, filled with radiation. And so Fresno has been walled off. And all the inhabitants of Fresno that were exposed uh, to all that radiation and mutagen and stuff have mutated. And they are stuck in this city like big together. Uh, big, big wall. I, think. I, don't know that the, I don't know that there's a dome on top. Uh, but they're all walled in together. And uh, it has a very, uh, a very lighthearted sort of feel to mm. it it feels uh you know they're definitely going for a trauma uh toxic avenger type feel tmnt uh, yeah i would say even yeah even turtles yeah. right even uh, and especially like if you were a fan of the turtles uh cartoon in the 80s yeah like season 10 ninja turtles like when it got re gets really goofy and like <laughs> you know um and really sort of much more jokey and lighthearted and and less serious so mm. this is a this is a lighthearted um you know, a, a lighthearted uh, version of Mutant Crawl Cra Classics, and Mutant Crawl Classics is already pretty tongue in cheek. I sure. think my, you know, my my version of uh, of playing it, Mutant Crawl Classics. If you're not familiar, it's sort of um, Goodman Games' version of Gamma World, mm. right? Which is a TSR game that was post apocalyptic, where everyone is mutating and has different mutant powers and stuff like that. Um, and so this particular uh, game is uh, much like Strixhaven's, why we paired it. It's back to school. It's in yep, high school. Yep. Um, and uh, in some ways, similar to my <laughs> similar to my feelings about Strixhaven, uh, I, this is not one that I would recommend. I love Goodman games. I love Dungeon Crawl Classics. I love Mutant Crawl Classics. Uh, but this is one you can skip. <laughs> um, the one thing that this adds to the Mutant Crawl Classics game is uh, a mechanic called oozing luck, which is based on the fleeting luck mechanic, which is uh, was first introduced in the Lankmar, the Dungeon Crawl Classics Lankmar uh, series. Great, great box set. Highly recommend that. Uh, but uh, so this brings fleeting luck into Mutant Crawl Classics as oozing luck. The basic idea of the mechanic is if you roll a twenty, you get a luck point, and if you roll a one. Everyone at the table loses a luck point. And so those luck points. Yeah. And those <laughs> luck points are like, you know, for those of you that play Savage Worlds, they're like Bennies, or for those of you that use inspiration in fifth edition, right? You get to spend them uh, to kind of manipulate the, the dice rolls and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you roll a one, it you you whiff, but then everybody whiffs, <laughs> right? It kind of it's it sucks the 
it sucks the luck out of everybody and then you've got to kind of build it up individually um so the mechanic is cool mm. um but now that I've told you that, just take fleeting luck from Lankmar, and if you want to use it in your Mutant Crawl Classics game, go for it. Um, yeah, the 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 best part about this, uh, besides the oozing luck, then would also be at the beginning. There are different um, you know different backgrounds that you can roll on, yeah. um, but again, they're all sort of high school themed, and I I feel like um, I feel like this has been done better. This seems like uh, like a '90s. Nickelodeon TV show. It feels nickel. That's that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but done in a way that is trying to be the '90s version of Blackout at Crater Valley, which oh. is a, one that we had yeah. uh, uh, reviewed in a previous episode. Uh, that was all about the '80s. In, yeah, you know, talking uh, very similar to like, or I made callbacks to '80s themes like slasher stuff and right. you know, Back to the Future and things like that. Uh, Blackout at Crater Valley hit the mark dead on boom it was really fun couldn't recommend it more really cool yep a lot of really cool aspects to it it was a fun like sort of mini adventure um a lot of cool aspects to it this seems like it's trying to be the 90s version of it <laughs> but in all the worst ways it just doesn't doesn't hit the same mark yeah it yeah blackout and crater valley i mean we've had two episodes mm -hmm. uh on it and we're talking about it now on a third episode because <laughs> it's great it's really good so if you want to if you want to do dungeon crawl classics and you want to do the 80s uh and be a teenager pick up that mm -hmm. pick up that module from terminal games um this one i i just i really feel like you can skip it it doesn't it doesn't really add much um it doesn't add much to mutant crawl classics and really for mutant crawl classics what i'm looking forward to is they're going to be coming out with Radiation Crawl Classics, mm. which is going to be a version of of Mutant Crawl Classics that is going to be more Mad Max post-apocalyptic, <laughs> right? So less of a focus on mutants, yeah. right, and mutations, and more of a focus on just sort of the the post-apocalyptic fight survival, survival mm. right? F fighting over resources and scarce resources and tribalism and all that kind of stuff. That seems really interesting. Yeah, so that's good. So I'm looking forward to Radiation Crawl Classics coming out. Uh, and like I said, this, um, this I would honestly skip. All right, well, this has been Every Edition, your tabletop RPG talk show. Make sure you check out our website at everyeditionrpg.com. And uh, check out all of our socials there. We uh, we do post on Patreon. We post on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all that jazz. So check out our socials. We've got different stuff going on around there. Uh, we're still trying to get to 100 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, that's our, our sort of main major goal. Um, so if you could, that'd be much appreciated. Thanks a lot.